then we have uh, zafir ahmed he is a disputes lawyer he works on matters in the supreme court primarily he is of counsel with of the bench and will be working with us closely and works on the of the bench dispute resolution matters he has also advised players and disputes relating payments and work with a lot of other multinationals welcome zafir i think zafir is stuck okay we'll be getting thank you dinesh yeah sure and then we have nikhil sharma he's been with us uh, with the uh, remand uh, dominic uh, session where he helped us to get uh, mr dominic on board uh, needs no introduction is been with clubs in india runs his own uh, uh, firm okay been a sports business professional familiar face of indian football he's worked with a lot of players coaches first with anglian sports and now with zlet and he just reminded me that i was late before this and uh, it's a sports management private limited firm thank you uh, nikhil for joining us so nikhil will be giving us perspective on you know how managing coaches managing players the business side of it welcome nikhil thank you so much dinesh that was a lovely introduction <laughs> So over to you, Shini. Uh, uh, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dinesh. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone. And uh, like Dinesh said, uh, we are very happy and uh, very proud to be working with the AIFC and helping football coaches in India uh, to develop a better ecosystem in India and give, I mean, help in whatever way we can. So, in fact, when uh, Dinesh and I got speaking for the first time. We thought one of the first things that we should do is probably do a basic introduction to professional contracts and the duties and obligations that uh, arise from those contracts. And that was the initial idea, which has finally culminated in this uh, webinar. And we hope to be—I mean, we hope to have some clearer minds at the end, and hope we can make that contribution as a first step. So, uh, like uh, Dinesh already said, uh, we'll we'll start with Nikhil. Nikhil, you've been working on the business side of football for a while now, and you know, I, I mean, you know how the wheel rolls, and you know how the transactions happen. I mean, yeah, right. there is a contract and there is paperwork involved, but there's a lot that happens before we come to getting the paperwork done itself. So, yeah. will you be able to take us through how it usually happens with football clubs in India, especially like how the transaction begins, how the negotiations begin, and at what stage do we say, okay, fine, let's sign on paper now? Right, right. Uh, uh, thank you, Sri. Uh, well, yes, I've been involved on both sides of the table. In fact, I've uh, you know as a director with the uh, with with the football club as well as now um, also uh, discussing. For coaches uh, with clubs, etc., for their contract, um, predominantly, I think paperwork is one part of it. Three, uh, in essence, you've got to agree on, you know, the partnership. A coach uh, is the most integral part of of a football club. Now, uh, I think any other person who brings, you know, there's no other person who brings the entire footballing ecosystem of. Players onto the table, and that's that's the coach. That's the only guy who possibly do. Or we also, you know, in the Western world, we call him the manager. In in India, uh, coaches play a dual role there. Uh, you know, you'd see a lot of big managers in England, etc., not necessarily are involved in a lot of. When I say involved, they are not coaching on the ground. So you would you would have seen, you know, the teams warming up before the matches. You wouldn't see Alex Ferguson standing there all the time back in the days. Uh, similarly, we've also seen some of the coaches who who are not there running training sessions. Training sessions are run by either assistant coaches, uh, but that's not the norm in India. Predominantly, you have one head coach, and more often than not, maybe 80, 90 percent of the time, he's the one who's running training sessions, uh, you know, and preparing players uh, for uh, for the games as well. When a team uh, so desires to say whether we want a fresh coach or a new coach. Or they want to change in plans. That's when they they start looking for a coach, and they have uh, they have some sort of an idea as to what they want out of a coach. Sometimes it's either the profile, so they say, uh, "Hang on, we are here. This is the kind of coaches that are coming through the system." Um, it might be a new coach or already somebody in the system. Uh, 
a lot of clubs go in and get their assistant coaches elevated or somebody who was uh, you know the under 23 coach or the under 19 coach or the reserve team coach in some cases even the under 15 coach so uh, or you get get him fresh out of the system which might be an indian coach or say a foreign for international coach as well uh, and there are four five things that they predominantly look at one uh, i think the biggest factor is familiarity uh, you know when either the ceos or uh, or uh, the owner who are very involved uh in in the running of the club uh, you know any other business you would not see owners being involved in absolutely everything uh with an organization but football is such a business that owners are very you know what they call skin in the game so they're always uh, themselves leading from the front and that's how they uh, they they find coaches so if they know of people in the system and they've seen what they've done with other clubs those are the first kind of uh, profiles that they go for then of course you know if if it's a, if it's somebody who's done really well won a championship which could be an i league championship could be an i league two championship uh, so far we've not seen uh, indian coaches head isl but you know eventually that will happen as well and they will see what what has been the coaches record uh, with the isl teams uh, and that's how they will they will get uh, those coaches it could either be under 15 so that's time merely result familiarity then they have a certain budget in mind they would always say these are the you know this is the salary package that i can give and this is the 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 other extras that we provide which could include a car or house uh food allowances or what and then of course you know uh, the coach's plan of what he wants to do and what the owner or you know the management wants to do so those are five six things predominantly at a bigger level that gets discussed uh before we move on to uh, paperwork again all of those has to has to be agreed you know coach has to be interested Uh, and coaches what i have seen from is you know they lo- they look at how professional a place is how good of people in and around traditionally clubs that have been you know very uh, very structured done very well uh, with people uh, in the system uh, that's where coaches usually want to go if you know the, the unfortunately as things stand football is a very cutthroat business per se so you know you will never know your uh, your longevity as a coach once you join uh, and it could be even you know two months to one year to six years you could, you know we we've had those examples but more often than not it's not a, it's not a long duration so you also want to see how long do i want to be here what's my roles and responsibilities and all of those in a certain sense get captured then on paper which is the next stage so uh, if you ask me what's the essence of it these six seven things are the essence of it uh, one of the things that we really look into when we sign of course uh you know players coaches us everybody wants to look at the packages of salaries but you know there are lots of other things that one needs to be uh be uh, sure of which is which is even bigger is to see what what exactly is the expectation of the owner of the club or the the ceo or the management out of you you know do they want you to go in and and win the championship is that is that realistic is it uh, do you have the resources to do it uh, resources not only mean the players but there's an entire ecosystem that's been built around uh, for 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 a coach to do well and if all of those are there and then what does the paper have what are the termination clauses like uh, you know in players case if you sign them on for a year that mean or a season that is a season you know you cannot just arbitrarily say well you are you're out you can't you can't say that to a player and uh, fifa has stringent laws there but in a coach's case the the contract can say either you know it can be unilaterally terminated it could be terminated with a two months mutual uh, and that's something that you would of course take it up but those are very very uh, important points to be considered uh, while drawing up papers so i think uh, you pretty much covered what we'd be looking to cover in the contract as well so i mean, essentially when we talk about Uh, what goes into a contract and what coaches need to be aware of when they are entering into a contract is capturing these commercial agreements on paper and giving it a binding nature now i mean what nikhil basically explained now would essentially be an agreement and as the law goes the contract act goes an agreement that is enforceable by law is called a contract and it's only to give it this enforceability element which is why we recommend always let's get into a contract let's get into a 
watertight, I mean, watertight in the sense, something that reflects what both parties have agreed into the common platform onto which the, uh, the two parties have gotten into that should be reflected on paper. And uh, I, I mean, one of the primary reasons why we insist that coaches should get into contract, I mean, coaches, any support professional, be it a sports scientist, physiotherapist, whoever's working with a club, why you should get into a contract is that the expectations and the obligations are very clear. And uh, so one of the first things that we see, I mean, we are lucky that we've got some, uh, a considerable amount of work in football in the last one year. And in every dispute, what we see is that the paperwork is not exactly what it should be or what it ideally should be. For instance, there is an appointment letter that's given and uh, the coaches or the support professional, they start working on the basis of the appointment letter. Now, what protection does it give the coach or the support professional? Nothing much. But when you enter into a contract, you automatically give yourself these protections. So when we see, when we say let's enter into a contract or you should enter into a contract, there are certain basic points which Nikhil already covered, which we insist should be written out clearly. The first ones, of course, the object of the contract. Now, in terms of the object of the contract, we all know the coach is going to work with the club, etc. But then when it comes into a dispute scenario later, you need things to be spelt out clearly. So for instance, when we say object of the contract, the contract should say that X person is being hired by the club to perform the role of head coach, youth coach, I mean, whatever the exact designation is so that you clarify things right up top that this is the role that the coach is going to enter into with the club. And that understanding flows throughout the document. The next one's term. Like Nikhil said, uh, for a player, a season's a season and that's very kosher. But then in terms of coaches, etc., there is a chance of termination in the middle. So we define the term of the contract, whether if it's going to be for one season or two years, three years. And more importantly, we also explain as to what is going to happen at the end of this term. Does the contract get automatically renewed or does, does the coach have the right to go to any other club or at what point of time, like six months before expiry or one year before expiry of the term, can the coach go and talk to a third party club and enter into a potential arrangement with them after this contract expires. Now, those things need to be defined clearly because it doesn't only deal with the present employment of the coach, it could also have an impact on the future employment of the coach. So we tie all loose ends possible through the contract. Now the next important bit is the rights and obligations. And this is where we go back to the common platform. Now, we want the coaches to be performing a certain set of responsibilities the club wants, but the coach should be able to perform these responsibilities and he, he or she should be convinced that they can perform these. I mean, you don't want unreasonable or unfair obligations being put. I mean, for instance, if a contract ends up saying that the head coach has to come down and monitor the affairs of the first team, reserve team and the youth team, it's pretty much impractical for the head coach to go down to the granular details of training of the youth team. So it's important to go through the duties and obligations, especially to see what is being expected by the club of the coach and if this is possible i mean can i deliver this kind of duty during the term and if not we can always get into a conversation with the club and try to adjust things around and the next important one which is very obvious is the remuneration bit and this i would say is answered by three specific questions what when and how now, the what part is, of course, is there just a fixed payment that's being made? Or like Nikhil said, in addition to the fixed payment, are there facilities being provided? Is there accommodation being provided? Is it going to be sharing accommodation or sing, uh, single accommodation? Are they going to give you a car? What are the allowances does the coach get as part of the contract? And every little detail goes into the contract and it gets captured that the club is going to give the coach these facilities along with the fixed amount or so. And then the when, which is most important because most disputes happen over payments not being made on time. And if we're going to go into a dispute as to it's not being made on time, then we need to define what the time is. Is it in advance at the start of the month or 
five days within the completion of this month, that is by fifth of the next month or the seventh of the next month, this needs to be captured clearly. And the last one is how, I mean, we have different forms of payments that happen. It can be by cash or is it a bank transfer, etc. In case of bank transfer, we clearly nominate that this is the particular account that we need to, we need to have the salary transferred into. And this again comes in handy. Zafir will cover the disputes part later and specifying which account you want your money in probably helps your case later on in case of non-payment or uh, a delay in payment, etc. Then the most important point again is termination of the contract. Like we discussed earlier, this is not a season to season affair and there can be termination in the middle. So termination needs to be specified clearly as to who has the right to terminate. How can we terminate? For instance, either party can give a notice of termination for say a period of three months and have the right to walk off the contract. It cannot be that only the club has the right to terminate and the coach just has to walk off when the club has terminated the contract. Now, in terms of players, of course, the player status regulations clearly define as to what is just cause for termination, etc. And we don't have a regulation which governs coaches' relationships like the player status regulation does. But because there is no legislation that governs this contract, it's more important to clarify what are the exact situations. Like, for instance, misconduct is a word that's used very freely. And it's probably best to define what is misconduct. If there are one, two, three, four, I mean, five different items which will constitute misconduct, then we need to clarify that this is all misconduct and I need to stop myself from doing any of this. Otherwise, my contract can get terminated or insurance is an obligation on a club always. And one of the grounds for termination is that if you do anything that prevents the insurance policy from being effective, the club can terminate. So. I need to know what the terms of the insurance policy is. So we should seek a copy of that policy so that we are aware of things that we need to comply with during the term of the contract. So essentially termination, considering it signifies how the relationship ends, should be focused upon to give a clear picture to both the coaches and the club as to these are the circumstances in which this relationship will end. And we're on the same page that this is how the, I mean, the process A, B, C are the steps in the process of termination at the end of which it will happen. So that prevents any uh, discord or dispute later on at the point of time of termination saying this is when um, the termination is supposed to come into effect or I'm not going to pay you till X date, I'll only pay you till Y date and all that. And the last and most important point which I would say we need to focus upon is what are the laws that are applicable and what are the laws that have to be complied with? Now this flows through the football industry and we always say that there needs to be a clause in a player contract or a coach's contract which say that all regulations that are being put forth either by the club itself, if it has an internal code of conduct, etc. Or by AIFF at any point of time and FIFA AFC regulations which apply to the coach's engagement would be applicable to this contract itself. I mean, for instance, one of the AIFF regulations that apply is the AIFF Code of Ethics. Now, the AIFF Code of Ethics, amongst other things, gives us a list of do's and don'ts in terms of ethical actions, match fixing, integrity issues, etc. So these laws will also apply because by virtue of the club being registered with AIFF, these laws will apply to the club and it has to flow down to the employees of the club as well and it applies to the coaches and players as well. So this compliance with law clause, which specifies the applicability of AIFF regulations is one of the most important things because end of the day, if the coach is seeking any remedy as well, we will end up going to AIFF and to go and seek remedy from AIFF, we need them to have the ability to give you the relief. And unless we explicitly call out that yes, AIFF has the ability to give me relief in relation to this contract, it's going to be a difficult affair. So we just clarify things right up front when we start our engagement with the club itself. Now, I mean, I just go back to what I was talking about, which is the AIFF code of ethics. Now, the general legal system in football goes very much hand in hand with integrity. 
and integrity in terms of match fixing and up illegal approaches, manipulation, etc., is a very big issue. And it's also being called out by a lot of experts because of the whole economic loss that accompanies the sport with COVID. A lot of these elements will come up again. And like Dinesh said earlier, we did reach out to AFC to give us some support in this. And AFC got back to us saying there's no one better than Javed sir to help us get a brief introduction of uh, integrity and the do's and don'ts that coaches need to be aware of in relation to integrity. So, Javed sir, over to you for an introduction. Uh, uh, before, uh, Shini, uh, so, sorry, Javed ji, just coming in. Before we go ahead, just a question for maybe uh, you and Nikhil can answer that. Uh, you know, it, it, two questions but can be uh, answered together. So, what are the, some of the major differences between contracts offered to a professional team coach and opposed to a youth team coach? That's one. I mean, is there a difference? Which Because we in, a, in AIFC, we have pro license coaches, C and even D and grassroots coaches. So, that is one. And second is, in, in modern football, a coach has a team behind the team, right? He's got his analyst, he's got his assistant coach, goalkeeping coach, SNC. Does all these also come as clause in the contract that I'm a coach and I'll have this team in my contract? So, uh, starting with uh, Nikhil, can you come in and then Shrini can add, please. Nikhil, you need to unmute. unmute. All right. So, the second question first. Uh, yes and no. Does, does the entire team come into uh, his contract? It can. Uh, you know, when, when an elite coach is being chosen, he's, he's not just himself. His team, uh, he relies on between three to five people. And at the absolute top, usually coaches move around in, in what we call packs. We, you know, it's, uh, that's the strength of the coach. So if, you know, at the absolute top, if a Mourinho is moving somewhere, it's not just him or if, uh, you know, it, it's their team and team outside of the pitch. So it's very important that whether it's on paper or it's off paper, that is agreed to, which says, uh, if I'm being paid, say, X amount, and X amount is needed for my team as well. And what are the facilities that they will get? It is, then there is also negotiation centered around, I want these four, but sometimes, you know, the team will come and say, look, we already have a very good SNC uh, coach, uh, strength and conditioning. Why don't we keep him back? Or we have a long-term contract with him. He's been very good or whatever the reason, or, you know, we want to bring in, uh, in, let's say, let's take an example of uh, an ISL team. You, you're mandatorily supposed to have an Indian assistant coach, in which case he has to be a part of uh, the incoming coach's team. Uh, and that becomes a part of the negotiation itself. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a part of the contract, but it can be. There is nothing that prevents it, uh, you know, a coach saying, put it down uh, on paper for me. Although usually when negotiations are held, if somebody says, hang on, this, you know, three people will be coming in from your team, which could be an assistant coach, which could be a SNC goalkeeping coach, or, you know, have multiple assistants or anything, an analyst, uh, as long as it's agreed, nobody puts it on paper saying, you know, it'll be because it's a, it's a verbal agreement. Also, whoever is coming in, uh, he needs to agree on personal terms with the team. It's not with the coach, it's with the team. So you can never put it down saying, these five people will come and this is what they want, but it's more or less agreed on before papers are signed. So that's part one. Part two, uh, an elite coach has, you know, because the clubs are at a certain level wherein they're very structured with their thinking, most of the things get captured either in conversations or on emails or on the contract paper. In a youth coach's case, usually the stakes from a team's perspective aren't very high. Uh, so, you know, or they're not looking to, you know, see only for a year. In some cases, it could be almost like an employment for the rest of, uh, you know, three years, four years, the contract, you know, in some cases, as Jimmy was saying, it's an employment, it's not even a contract per se. So they'd say, you know, this, here is the, the starting, um, you know, offer letter or anything of that sort, and you start now. Uh, the, the things that are covered are very minimal in it. So it doesn't necessarily have to have a, a big uh, paper which has a lot of legal terms, et cetera, et cetera. Something very simple does the job for a youth coach. Is it, 
a better or paperwork required? Yes and no. I'm look while we're talking a lot of paperwork here. I also want to say you know like coaches like to believe that everything should be simple, should be understandable to everybody, and then the legal framework kind of takes care. So barring those two things, you know, you do you require. I've seen 20, 22 pages. Somebody sent me a 32-page contract for a player and a coach. Is it required? From my perspective, I don't believe so. You know, as long as we both want to do the right things, we can capture some basics well. That's sufficient. But I think that's how the evolution of football in India and the world are. You know, that people want to have extensive uh, clauses for a lot of things. So uh, those are basically the differences, really, from my end. Shrini. No, I I think I agree with Nikhil, especially in terms of the youth coaches. the contract i mean it it doesn't it's not drastically different from what a head coach will enter into but then it gets i mean it, it it if i can call it it's a smaller version of that contract your duties and obligations get more focused because a head coach or a first team coach has so many other things relating to the squad that he has to take care of those duties and obligations reduce a lot but if you have to ask me as a lawyer i would probably add in some more protections especially when it comes to working with youth players and minor players for instance both for the coaches and for the players like for instance now in uk abuse of coaches in grassroots systems a massive issue i mean yeah our grassroots system might not be as formalized as it is in the uk but then we still getting there we we like our grassroots system is kicking and alive and you need that kind of a protection that's probably built in to the youth coaches contracts as well it could be a precaution i mean you can call me being overly cautious but i would always err on the side of caution um so there's something that can be built specific and uh, in terms of bringing in a team uh, it goes in like nikhil said you enter into contracts in good faith so if you have an agreement and you shook hands over it it's not going to change when the roll out happens but maybe one thing that the head coach can put in is probably have the first right to suggest or appoint names have a person of his choice i mean you need not specify the name but say that i have the first right over appointing an assistant coach or a goalkeeper coach like you said so that doesn't go into names and tomorrow if the club and the coach want to discuss and arrive at a third party candidate who's not from the coach's original team that also works in the framework of the same contract yeah yeah uh, completely agree the, the point uh, made here was not not about a 20 pager or a 30 pager but maybe if it's even if it's one or two pages uh, for us it's important that the coach's interests is taken care of yeah. tomorrow if there's a dispute we know that all the points are covered we we cover it in two pages three pages whatever but we need to keep it crisp yeah nikhil dinesh uh, just very quickly see what happens is unfortunately football the game it is is very very passionate and uh, how things start usually they don't end that way you know success is very very few you know if there are 20 teams only one two uh, even sari is considered a failure after winning a championship so that's how uh, ruthless the world is so you know while there's good faith when you start Uh, and this is from both sides look yeah, we are not trying to protect only one yeah. side of the thing that so be very careful with certain few things that's very important rest of it has to you know we are human beings at the end of the day uh, you know football's a game of passion we have to enjoy what we are doing and enjoy it together otherwise there's no fun yeah. that's when you get examples like a club that's when you get you know such beautiful examples even in indian football so uh, exercise caution but yet don't get to bog down by paperwork to get you know uh, to let that go that's it thank you completely javed sir if uh, you can now take us through the integrity portion yeah uh, can you hear me well yes sir yes sir hello good afternoon to all uh, the coaches to whom mostly i call as the architects of the football because they make the football they mark the football and they are behind every success stories of the football and most of the time camera focuses on the coach itself and the reactions which they give many of them are very good 
but uh, they are certainly they will be feeling frustrated because they cannot go to the grounds the sports is closed because of this corona and uh, naturally like the footballers uh, our bookies are also very frustrated match fixers are also frustrated very much desperate uh, they are waiting in wings that the game should start and they can uh, be on the job so naturally we are expecting more vulnerability on the game which is going to start in future but it has started already in uh, european countries but in india i hope that certainly we will have a proper season this year also so what they did this <coughs> book is they are frustrated but they have to earn money they can't earn money from the retail cost of the matches so what they are doing they are betting on the soap football what is the soap football something very unique nobody was Uh, making it very popular now there is a soapy ground on the uh, on the rooftop or somewhere in the malls and they are playing football uh, on a soapy surface so they are doing a, a lot of betting on that a lot of reports coming in and uh, they are betting on the friendly matches mostly friendly matches are not very well monitored by the federations and they lack a lot of integrity in uh, vacuum is there and uh, on the other hand the players Uh, they have suffered loss of job, suffered salary cuts. Uh, they are also not in very good shape, so they can be also easy targets, uh, and they can be manipulated by all those people who are there and fixers and all these things. So my in my way, the main thing is the coach, and the coach is the person who should be a man of high character because the players they always imitate their coach. They see. how he works how he behaves uh, in private life as well as on the ground so they always watch the coach and they expect that he should be a man of high integrity and high degree of honesty actually uh, the heart of a character is integrity as well as the honesty both the things are there only then i can say coach can be a role model for the players the next thing is that uh, what we see feel that people say that integrity and honesty they are one of the same thing no it is not like that integrity is slightly above honesty because honesty is a part of integrity but on integrity covers everything it covers the honesty as well as you know, the entire entire working personal life of the person or you can just for an example you can say that uh, we always ask our children to speak truth but what happens we ourselves we speak lies so this is sometimes i mean one is the honesty and other part is that we are lacking the integrity similarly we can say that if we go to a motel and just for a dinner suppose we are going for a motel in a dinner we found a purse full of money what i do i search out the person and give the money return back the purse that is a part of my honesty but the fact that when i went to the motel for taking the dinner i was having a, a mistress with me that is lacking your integrity so on one way you are saying this is integrity is losing your integrity on the other hand you are uh, showing your honesty also so there can be hundreds of such examples but the thing is that integrity includes honesty so one have to be very much clear that his personal life is watched when somebody says that he is a man of integrity so there are so many uh, i think uh, fifa has launched programs uh, in 2011 that is called as fifa integrity action plan and under that plan they started worldwide about the integrity of the matches and that first point was the zero tolerance that is zero tolerance against match fixing and the corruption and that is the program of fifa and aiff also follows the same thing that there should be zero tolerance for match fixing fifa also made uh, a program like three hours of integrity three hours of integrity is very famous throughout the world means that you have to first hour means recognize then reject and report means recognize means what suppose somebody is there who is known to you or somebody who is not known to you and is calling you just before an important match two three days before important match you don't know this man some un unknown numbers are coming so what do you do 
you can tell him hey, i don't want to attend your uh, i i simply say sorry to him i don't give any response to him or even if the, suppose the man is known to you but he did not contact you since long i think uh, one year back and something somewhere met in the seminar somewhere casually you met them and he is contacting you why what could be the reason for that you can politely say no to him reject the offer and say no i am busy in a very important assignment because most of the such meetings some calls are from the fixer from the match manipulators so we always ask especially the players that uh, especially the players and even the coaches also they also receive such calls and uh, mostly they uh, many of the people are from the, their uh, training mates they may they met them somewhere in the training in foreign country i uh, i have seen one thing uh, he said i received this uh, call from pakistan and this man met me somewhere in malaysia and somewhere and he is calling me why is calling me and just one day before the match so it happens so he simply refused that type of thing and you have to report that also because why i normally ask my players that whenever they receive such calls they should uh, take the screenshot record the calls and report it to their team manager because team managers are always uh, called as a nodal officer of integrity for any club so we ask them to report to them or they can also report to us directly but since the players as players can uh, easily approach the team manager so we ask them to do it on the other hand there are some issues we want that coaches should be proactive because nowadays the major point is about the communication devices all the around the world one by somebody sitting in europe he can make manipulation he can put money on a indian matches even the matches which is not popular in india they put money on that and they earn a lot of money on that we don't know even that this club footballs i mean or in some time in a, a college football also they put money in it so we ask the coaches to be very proactive and not to accept the friendship uh, on the facebook uh, because everybody can't be your fan you feel he is your fan you accept a friendship maybe he is a fixer because in cricket mostly the things have happened like this even in not only in uh, cricket in football also it has examples have come like this so don't accept these uh, uh, fear when casually you can now, uh, may not accept the friendship on the uh, facebook and also uh, uh, on the whatsapp uh you always we are only heavy to putting our status that yeah i am sitting there i am there in top place suppose i go go to ybk stadium in calcutta put a photograph with a ybk stadium what i am doing i am i am disclosing my place of presence that yeah i am today in calcutta so better is not to disclose uh, your location uh, these are the preventive things which from where you can uh, save yourself and you must be knowing all that betting is not allowed in india under uh, it is illegal in india so no betting whatever you show be it should be uh, on online betting or through agent or something it should it is not at all allowed so one should not do it but i will ask my coaches to watch some of the soft targets in the team mostly what the betters are doing what the fixers are doing they target our goalkeepers and strikers so these coaches are to be very uh, i mean vigilant about this fact that they have to monitor their goalkeepers as well as the strikers because most of them can be easily susceptible they can be vulnerable for all these type of manipulations this these two players should be always watched by the coaches and one very important part of the thing is that third goal in any match many of you must be knowing what is asian asian total it is a type of betting when oh, asian total is a type of uh, um, uh, betting when the number of goals is more important in mind i mean that they are not concerned with the goal uh, uh, or with the uh, with a team winning or b team winning they are mainly concerned with the number of total goals so what they have calculated that on an average there is a total number of goal in a match it is 2.5 they have calculated 2.5 is the average goal in any match so they say below 2.5 or above 2.5 so they bet for this that 2.5 below or 2.5 above so that's how suppose if some there is a two goal and somebody makes third one so the total seen changes the person who is winning now is losing so this asian total makes the third goal very important so we have to be very uh, clear about this fact that if our player deliberately commits the mistakes 
uh, which lead to the third goal. Maybe it is a handball. Maybe it is such a uh, thing which leads to penalty. Or our goalkeeper, our goalkeeper is not taking attention, and there is third goal. The very serious things are there, and uh, everybody from top watches such actions on the third goal. And uh, you must knowing there is a company like Sport Radar that is based in London, and uh, uh, AIFF is monitoring all the important matches through that company, and they give us a report which is called as a red red color red flag or clear report. So all the matches they give us that is a clear match or there is any doubt about this type of uh, match, they immediately tell us. And another point is about the leakage of insider information. In every team, they say uh, there is something which is going on inside. The coach is having a strategy they are having a plan that how to deal with with a particular player in a particular match so he is discussing he is planning but suppose if it goes out in the media even if a very small thing like some player is uh, sick he is not going he's an important player he is not going in the match uh, going uh, next match so it makes the if he is changing uh, i mean this information goes out uh, then certainly it's very dangerous and uh, you know, it changes the entire scenario and the opposite team gets prepared for all these things. So these are insider information. It should not be leaked out. Maybe it appears to you that somebody is sick and he's having a fever. It is very simple thing. I think it's like it is an innocuous type of thing. But if it goes to the media, it changes the entire betting market. So what we have done that whenever the team is going uh, for a hotel stay outside the place, we ask our players, ask our team managers as well as the coach that they should not allow outsiders to come there and meet the players. Nobody, the, I mean, they should not take anybody to the hotel rooms. And even suppose some relatives are there and they have want to meet him, let them come. Permission may be given to them, but it will be a meeting in the lobby only. The meeting can't be inside the room. And next point comes about taking girlfriends, staying there. There have been some cases when uh, foreign players who are top players, I've seen them coming and they were having their family. Naturally, families can be allowed, but naturally, uh, uh, families can't be changed like that. That here are some family there, somewhere, okay, he's go to a rice station and say, this is my family. It can't be like this, family remains the same. So that is the discretion of the team. They can allow, they can say no to, but they can also allow them. But normally, in uh, Indian place, I have seen mostly they are not having these things. So girlfriends should not be allowed uh, to be there. And there are something like the gifts to the player. I've seen many of the sport promotion companies, they go with the gift and say, this is a gift I brought for your players. Like it's a simple, very simple thing, this sports shoes or dresses or jeans, something like this. But once I checked, they, I found that uh, the company was not at all a sport promotion company. It was a bogus company. They just wanted to have an access to the players. So they just became come, uh, uh, as a, a sport promotion company. So you have to be very careful uh, when you allow somebody uh, to meet your players. And there are some uh, serious problems comes when some old players and uh, player agents, uh, they go and meet the players. Uh, because old players are very easily they can have access to the club meet anybody in the club so uh, most of them turn as a player agent so that creates like a different uh, complex problem because these player agents many times uh, i have noticed there can be some connection with the betters also the betting market also and now there's a new uh, thing about the data scouts now data scouts uh, they are they're collecting data and just providing this data to different to the parent company. But unfortunately, those parent companies are providing data to betting market on a real-time basis. So that creates a problem. In fact, uh, the data collected by them from here, it goes straight to the betting company. You have to be very careful. And one uh, case was noticed when the, uh, this data is out, he came and he was not sitting with the uh, media persons, but he went somewhere on the upside sitting with the uh, with the spectators and passing on information from there. Suppose you do, you allow them, you just allow them in the area which is meant for the uh, for the media person, so that he may not be allowed to go outside and share something separately. 
So these problems are there, which are coming up. Yeah, simply, I just wanted to read them. And uh, recently, in the last few matches, we, um, we noticed that uh, their mind game, mind game is being played with the players when there is an important match. Or even with the coaches also, the mind game is played. And what is that man, mind game? Suppose I disturb you when the match is going to be there. I disturb you just one day, two days before the match. You lose all your concentration. So what happens? When the concentration is lost, you, you lose the match also. You are not concentrated there. And very simple issues are there. Like you are saying about the context. Somebody calls you, he is your friend or maybe he is somewhere. He says that uh, when your contract is going to be over, Mostly the contracts are for one year. They say, yeah, it is only one year. They say, what is the next year's plan? They say, nothing certain. I don't know. Then what he will say, okay, I will take you to my club. You come to my club next year. Now the man is disturbed badly. And that player is just thinking what will happen next year. So like that, he receives the calls and all these things before the matches just to make you lose concentration. So that's uh, better course is to keep the mobile phones uh, at a separate place, at least when there is an important match. And many of the teams are uh, performing these things that uh, the match should be played uh, two days before that you should deposit the phone in the club. And you can take only once when there is a, uh, when there is a practice session, then you go and take the phone and just call whatever family friends you want to call. And not only this, I have seen some of the very good, good clubs, they don't allow their players to go to the home two, three days before the match. So they, they say they lose the firepower. There is nothing like this. Uh, better course is not to allow them to keep them in a hotel so that they are available there. And so, I think we will just like to tell one more thing that uh, there are sting operations being made on the coaches also because the coaches are very important people for selecting the players. In fact, what I feel that they are the captain of the team, they can do anything. Like in cricket, we feel there is a captain, but here the captain is actually the coach. He can select the player, reject the player. I mean, I can be placing the bench or something like this. So this happened in uh, Nigeria, where even coach was there. He was the assistant coach who was going to be the main, uh, who was going to be the main coach uh, in 2020 Olympic. His name is uh, Salasu Yosu. He is from Nigeria. He was caught in a sting operation. Some uh, football, uh, some player agents went and met him and say, "Take this player for this uh, for this team." And they caught him red-handed. In fact, there are some sting operators in that country. Although we are also having many or plenty of them, but they are, they are not concentrating on football now. So, but they are doing it in Nigeria. Uh, when Anas Army who is there, he is a person who is doing a lot of uh, sting operations. The man was caught. His career is jeopardized. He's nowhere now. So you have to be very uh, alert from these things. And also the also the players. I have seen many of the players, uh, all the players are young players, uh, and uh, they can be uh, easily honey trapped. So they have to be uh, alert from that honey trapping also. So the coaches are to monitor them that uh, they're not given night outs when they are in a hotel or staying outside. So the coach duty is overall just like a guardian also, and just to maintain the team also. They have to keep their standards very high, and there are some good qualities which is said. The coaches which are, who are having good character, coaches which are competent, who are committed, and who are very caring, caring at the personal level also. And they have they are the confidence builders, and then they are very good communicators and consistent. Obviously, the consistency, whether they are losing, they are winning the game, they have to maintain the consistency. And that's how he this is this could be a, 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 a success story for a coach. I think uh, I've taken a lot of time and I will thank you very much. Hope you do better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. sir I think uh, if we can take one takeaway each from the start and the end of your presentation, the coach is the most important person in the football ecosystem. And he also happens to be the most important person in the integrity ecosystem as well, because the coach essentially is the first point of contact for both the team and the administrative uh, side of the sport. No, we uh, again, thank you very much, sir. So we've had a very good introduction into integrity and the key issues that uh, constitute the sports integrity landscape as well. So one major piece which we are discussing today, which uh, my colleague Zafir will cover now is 
how does the dispute uh, procedure happen as such like we get into a contract we get into arrangements everything but at the end of the day the moment there is a disagreement whatever is written it ends up going into a dispute so if you can you take us through the dispute resolution process both within the AIFF and otherwise and give us a brief idea yeah sure th thanks rini so basically the coach uh, like all the panelists have already said like the coach has a very critical role to play so the way i see it this role can be broken into two parts one is the coach's relationship with the club and the second is the coach's relationship with a player now the coach's relationship with the player is on behalf of the club so generally for the time being we can omit that because whatever dispute i mean whatever issues there can be between a player and a coach is technically a dispute an issue between a player and the club so we are not going to go into that but i will come back to it at the end the second and the main issue that happens is when a coach and is in relation is in the context of the relationship between a coach and a club so a coach and a club again like nikhil and dinesh uh, and shrini went went over earlier essentially the an agreement a coaching agreement needs to capture certain essentials the more clarity you have on these aspects the better is it for uh, uh, the better better it is in case there is a dispute so the primarily the disputes happen one when there is a clear stated objective or goal for instance if if uh, when there is no uh, clear stated objective or goal as is what is the expectation from a coach in a season if that is not clear if that is not clear there's always a case for challenging any termination or non payment and not that itself is another issue that is uh, termination and non payment that is another area of dispute now the third and other i mean most of the uh, disputes happen in the context of these two but when when the context uh, when uh, when the dispute in these two aspects there are a lot of uh, issues that come into effect that is that is for instance non payment or deduction of salaries they uh, what we see is that sometimes clubs end up reducing i'm just taking 2 minutes to kind of uh emphasize on the importance of having a contract and then i will come to the dispute resolution process uh so what happens is a, an agreement will generally have that the coach will abide by the uh, code of conduct or the code of conduct of the club will maintain the integrity statement of integrity policy of the club or will ensure that will uphold the brand image of the club but a lot of times we contracts use these terms loosely without clearly defining what the code of conduct of the club is so it is important that when we mention all these terms in the contract these terms are clarified so if you mention a code of conduct of the club that code of conduct needs to be annexed as part of the agreement so that in case there is a dispute over non payment or deduction or non payment or termination you can always refer back to point out what exactly the breach is what exactly uh, a default is in terms of the contract because the moment you step outside into ambiguity it's it always becomes a long drawn out battle of proving what is what now uh, uh, so and again on termination now termination this again is something that uh, at the time of entering into a contract one needs to be careful of because generally unlike in the case of players the termination of a coach is not really well regulated so you you can have a termination on the basis of a notice or and sometimes what clubs do is the contract would say that you can terminate a contract with 30 days notice uh, or if you don't give a 30 days notice if it's immediate termination then you pay a termination penalty termination amount so a lot of times clubs enter into something called as mutual termination agreement a mutual termination clause because the agreement would also state something called you can terminate mutually without any payment of cost to each other so at the time of termination and this is very cleverly done by some clubs at the time of termination they will send a notice saying we find that we are not mutually agreeable to situation etc etc so uh, i think it is best to part ways we, we would uh, we would like you to accept this termination so the coach says yeah okay i accept the termination so that usually takes the form of a mutual termination in which case the coaches don't get the payment 
Now, in terms of dispute itself, uh, like Srini already said, it's basically the AIFF and the sports ecosystem that uh, the regulatory body ecosystem that governs the disputes largely. In uh, the AIFF, the regulations, it's Article 28, which kind of gives the power to the AIFF to adjudicate on what are the different kinds of disputes. So one of them is in relation to disputes between the club and uh, club and the coach. And Article 30, under Article 30 of the regulations, of uh, uh, the AIF is supposed to set up a national dispute resolution chamber. Currently, that hasn't been set up. So there isn't really a, a, a elaborate guidelines or rules that govern this. And for the time being, the, uh, uh, luckily, the AIF has also kind of uh, figured an interim arrangement. So what they have done is that till such time that this process is not, uh, the, uh, we do not set up the NDRC, the dispute resolution chamber, all such disputes will also be undertaken by the player status committee. Now, uh, so ideally what happens is, and this is also in a, in a way an efficient or a time and cost efficient mechanism as well. We, and it, it, it applies not just to just a coach's dispute, but generally all sorts of dispute. What we always recommend is instead of going, going to the adjudicating body here in the case, the player status committee, always send out a notice saying that this is your issue. Please address it. Give them a time timeline to address the issue so that without having to, because once you enter the process, you need to go through that entire, you, once you file a formal complaint or take it up as a case, then you need to go through the entire process before it can be adjudicated. Or of course there is this whole settlement issue, which happens in normal civil disputes. Now, uh, in addition to the, uh, in, uh, uh, so generally, uh, in case of any dispute that is there, always send out a notice, give some time for the, for your, and lay down what your issues are, what you require to resolve these issues and give a timeline for re resolving these is issues. Ideally in, uh, the main issue is usually non-payment or uh, non-payment of wages or, uh, non-payment of outstanding dues. So generally give a 15 days period. If that doesn't happen, then you escalate it into a dispute resolution chambers. Now, other than this, now what happens if your contract does not specify? Now, of course, the AIFF is trying to kind of standardize and bring in clauses so that there is some kind of standard maintained. Now, what happens? So the one way to ensure is in your agreement, you mentioned specifically that this is the dispute resolution process that you are adopting. Because if you don't adopt that process, because of the fact that the AIFF itself does not have these regulations in place, there is always a possibility of AIFF washing its hands off and saying that, sorry, in your contract, you have said that a civil court of Delhi will have jurisdiction. Now this coach may be, coach may be a resident of Bangalore and imagine, in your contract, you're mentioning that and his contract has been terminated. Now imagine a scenario that the co coach has been terminated. He doesn't have accommodation. He doesn't have anything. He's back home. And now to get his wages for his dues, he needs to actually institute a suit in Delhi because that's what the parties have agreed. So that's why it becomes and civil courts, unlike AIFF, AIFF, uh, because, because of the kind of reforms and the changes that it's been bringing about, and because it's been laying down and standardizing the entire practice, uh, AFF has a very time bound process, uh, has a slightly time bound process compared to what an ordinary civil dispute or ordinary courts would happen. I mean, all the news reports that we see about delays in judicial system, that is very much a issue for anyone who wants to. The uh, issues that we have. And in addition to that, one more issue, uh, this is the disputes aspect. And one more aspect that I would like to just kind of highlight is the post termination effect. Now in <clears throat> and post termination effect is your something called as non compete uh, clause. Now, and it, that is a very gray area in India, because depending on the facts and circumstances of each case, there is, uh, it can be enforced, it cannot, it may not be enforceable. Uh, ideally, it is in, in the best case scenario, it's usually non enforceable, but generally in some of the situations, it can be enforced. For instance, you may very well have a clause which says that on termination, if the coach 
coach's mandate is terminated in the middle of a season he'll be paid two months wages but he but for the remainder of the season he will not take up employment with any other club so these are kind of things that you need to kind of look into and make sure that the co- contract addresses these concerns because uh, the like how we began this entire uh, how we began this entire session you know the better clarity that we have in any contract the better it is for everyone involved it's not just for the player it, but it's not just for the coach but also for the club as well as uh, the player and i think i don't want to take much time unless you there's any specific issue that you would want me to address uh, i hope i've been clear on what exactly is the process followed in case anybody wants any further information so zafit there's actually a question that's come in from mr tapoosh ghosh yes. it uh, ties into the whole termination uh, which you were just discussing so the question is what happens when a coach signs a contract and after a month of the employment leaves for his native place saying someone is not well in the family and two months later the coach goes back to the club and says give me an noc i want to go and join somewhere else interesting see this 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 is this is actually again it would what i mentioned that it this goes we need to kind of look at what the contract says because generally a contract uh, because these are professional contracts generally you are expected to be available for that entire period and uh, entire period so these cl- and most of the clauses generally have like a personal uh, personal emergency ex- a personal emergency clause which allows you a, uh, uh, which allows you uh, to kind of uh, take leave but un- if such a clause is not there then it becomes an issue uh, uh, you also need to look at is whether your contract provides the option for you to quit and if it allows you to quit then under what circumstances because unlike a player unlike a player who is contracted for the season regarding noc etc a manager does not is not really contracted for the as in the regulations don't tie a manager down to a club for the entire duration of the contract a player cannot quit a club and say i no i will not a player can only sit out but he, till the term till the expiry of the term a player has to continue, is on contract with the club he cannot play for someone else whereas a a uh, manager uh, he he can all, i mean subject to what the contract states he can all if the contract gives him an option to quit and resign as the manager then he can very well quit and then go ahead if if the contract provides for the uh, resignation clause then he can very well uh, resign and then join another club so that's not really an issue provided again there is no non compete clause in the contract so uh, senior would just like to come in here uh zafir uh, thank you so much uh, just a question here is uh, this is benefit for all the coaches and uh, you know all the support staff uh, in case a co- coach faces an issue with delay or denying of payment yes you know, i know you've already uh, uh, explained that can, but can you just reinforce it what steps must the coach take a coach has left a club or is you know he's been denied payment or delayed payment if you just put in basic from a coach's side what steps should he take so uh, i mean if we have to just go step wise it ties in with what uh, zafir was saying some time back as well the first step would probably be to get into a mutual discussion where we say like listen this is the issue that i have in case we can come to a compromise let's try within a fixed time period say 10 days 15 days or so now if that compromise is not coming through within these 10 days and 15 days then Uh, as per the current structure the coach will have to go to the player status committee with his complaint his or her complaint now the player status regulations require for players requires a 15 day notice to be given to the club to clear all the outstanding dues now we don't have it specifically written down for coaches but because we are going to the player status committee now that's probably the appropriate procedure to follow as well so we can issue a notice to the club for a period of 15 days or more saying please clear the outstanding amounts within this time and if the club either categorically denies that that amount has to be paid or does not respond at all during this period of time and does not pay basically during this 15 days or so then a written complaint can be filed with the uh, AIFF and then AIFF will take it up with all the necessary proofs so 
This is why I earlier mentioned that, uh, for instance, you need to specify a particular bank account. So you can give a print of the transactions between the club and that particular bank account, showing that this was denominated in the contract and say, I've not been paid for March, April and May or whichever month it is. And with all the necessary proofs, we can file a complaint with the IFF and the committee then takes it up and passes its order. Okay, Shini, just one more maybe question before we wind up. Uh, you can all chip in. I think uh, Nikhil spoke about this a bit and even you covered it. But uh, now, you know, usually when we sign uh, on an insurance form and there are these small letters that are written behind, no one reads it. Yeah. And even when you, you take a SIM card or a phone, you know, you just sign it. But you don't, yeah, you don't right. read between the lines. No one reads it. I mean, uh, even me. But if you ask me as, uh, you know, there are some young coaches, the lawyers read professional coaches. If... <laughs> if uh, if they have a contract now they, go, they they are signing a contract with a club and the club has sent them a draft can you you know if you tell it these are the five things or seven things that they need to check to make sure that you know they are in in, in safe zone what would that be i mean if you all, all could chip in and tell us what could that be it will be yeah yeah nikhil can we start with you yeah so uh, i won't go into the details i think uh, both uh, uh, but the lawyers are more uh, accomplished to answer that. But I, I kind of uh, want to go a little step further here and say uh, the real life scenario is such, Dinesh, that we technically right now have, an, in terms of the top tier clubs, we have only about 30, 32 clubs. At Mota Moti, you know, you take all the clubs and that's the only 30, 32 clubs. You know, if you count your A licenses, your pro licenses, your B licenses, I won't go to the C's right now, then they're not not many employ gainful employment opportunities for the coaches. Uh, so, firstly, my, my advice to coaches will be, see, um, there are lots and lots of young, good, upcoming lawyers who specialize in sports now. So even if you don't want to go with, say, somebody who's a representative or an agent, because I understand clubs, you know, and, and, and coaches as well, because they're only about, you know, your Pro licenses are 1920, if I'm not wrong, the numbers around that, the not many clubs are 20, 20 clubs or so technically you are one on one for pro licenses, right? So everybody knows everybody, owners, CEOs, you talk directly, everything is handled. There's no harm, contracts are decent enough to gainfully get a lawyer to go through and uh, even deal with the club. Now, this is not unprofessional behavior or it's not. You know, what happens with coaches is because they were, a lot of them were former players. They feel, people will feel bad if I employ or get in, you know, a representative in between, which could be a lawyer or an agent as well. I don't think so. You know, clubs have lawyers as well. They, you know, people who are negotiating contracts with you are business people. They have a very good understanding of paperwork. If you need help, you know, like players need help with coaches, you please go ahead and have somebody that, you know, I can... I can assure you for the contracts that, you know, I-League clubs or ISL clubs give, uh, you know, lawyers are not super expensive. That, that's in the mind that But do it. There's no harm to it. Get understanding. Also, it will help you if something goes south. That's the first part of it. The second part of it, we also, uh, look, the situation of football is not exactly very rosy. Not in India, not across the world. Everybody, you know, in their own little way, everybody looks at the Premier League, but that's not the situation across the world. You know, everywhere else, uh, clubs are also struggling to stay afloat. Their, you know, finances are not the best around. That doesn't mean they should not pay you salary that they've committed to you. But we must all say, for example, there's COVID right now. You know, yes, coaches have been affected, but the clubs have been very affected as well. Most of the clubs are single owner. Uh, uh, clubs, you know, who might be relying on certain other businesses for money, etc. So there's one part to understanding what's happening. Two part to understand if somebody commits you, you know, there are some people who will tell you, I will pay you in March. And before March 31st, your salary comes. Maybe it's only half of it. So it's also important for, you know, coaches and people to understand that it works both ways. So if somebody said, I will pay you then, you know, you, you should not get too hard-nosed about it and say, Otherwise, I will file a case. Because cases, etc., thankfully, the FF is very, very uh, responsive to it. You know, they've taken care of it. And some, some clubs, a few also have, you know, who haven't really, uh, you know, followed up on their commitments. Uh, but most, mostly you'll see that there are arrangements. So uh, even 
And when that happens, the lawyer is all, always good to kind of say, sensible, smart uh, sports lawyers, because some of the others might not understand what the background into the sport is. So try and get, and I'm not just saying just Srini or uh, Zafir or anybody. You might, there are lots and lots of good ones. You can always refer to them. You could also have agencies that are looking into it, advise you properly. There's no harm in seeking professional help and doing things, but also have a bit of realism, which is, you know, we're not in a, in a very rosy situation in, in terms of the club, in terms of where coaches stand, because there are, there are lots of coaches coming in and not as many opportunities. So they're also very careful about, you know, we don't want to hurt the clubs. We don't want to get into dispute, etc. But it can all be done in a very nice fashion. Sometimes I think one out of 10 will go out of hand, but, you know, such is life. Life also uh, throws those things at us. That's about it. I think those insurance pointers, etc. is something that, you know, I'd leave it to the best guys to answer. No, so I, Nikhil, uh, Dinesh, sorry, to address the small print issue that you pointed out, it's not an issue with the coaches' contracts or player contracts, sports and possibly anywhere else where the bargaining power is a little skewed. There's one party which is more powerful than the other party. What usually happens is there are a specific terms and then there is a standard terms. Specific terms is very nicely put in font 14 showing this is the amount that you'll get, these are the benefits, this is the kit you'll get. And then there is a two, three page standard terms, which is in font size 10 or font size 8, which is basically going to say that I am going to give all the, all the stuff in font 14 when I want and in this particular way. So, I mean, like Nikhil said, it's probably good to engage professionals, be it agents, be it lawyers, or even a, a CA or an auditor who's helping you with stuff to just go through and see that it's not completely loaded against you. Like, yeah, there is an element of fairness in the contract and you get into it. Like you said, the insurance policies, that's something that most players and coaches need to comply with. But I mean, all of us have life insurance and health insurance, but I doubt even 1% of us would have gone through the whole policy document. It basically comes down to the fatigue factor of going through such a document, but considering it's part of our employment and it's going to play an integral part over the next 10 months, one year, two years, it's probably good we spend that half an hour, 40 minutes more that it takes to go through the fine print and see everything's in order before entering into the contract. I think, yeah, rightly said, and it's time. It's not only getting professional in your coaching techniques, but even getting professional in everything related to your job. That's important. So getting the right people on board to help you, to help you with contracts, to help you with, you know, with, I think every aspect of your, your, your job or your profile. I think that's rightly said by Nikhil and uh, Shini. Uh, I think uh, one question to Javidji. Uh, what will be, I think you've already covered it, but if a coach, uh, especially when you mentioned that amateur clubs are now targeted for match fixing, right? So what is in one line, if you would say, you know, what should a coach do? I'm a coach and I know now there's something happening, two things, is in my club or happening in some other club. What is, what should the coach do? Uh, the coach must immediately inform uh, his club and also to us. And we can take whatever action the best possible. And what we have noticed that the clubs which are just rising, newly coming up clubs, like uh, whatever in Kashmir club, you can see rising. Uh, this uh, we What we found that such clubs which are just coming up or just clubs which have just entered the I League, they are more susceptible and they are being targeted by the, um, uh, targeted by the bookmakers, uh, but not just old clubs. Old clubs are not that much up because maybe they are very strong. They no, don't no, try to go and manipulate there. Uh, but for these small clubs, it's very difficult uh, situation. They have to be very careful, especially the coach is to be very honest and very upright. Thank you. Thank you, Javiji. Um, Shini, if you could just summarize and then I think we have, we are already, uh, we have overshot, but it's, it's been a good discussion and I think Zafir wants to add something and then Shini no, can summarize yeah. it. I just, I just wanted to like quickly just address the question that Dinesh uh, asked regarding what are the key terms. Uh, and this is just to kind of tie in the entire uh, conversation. So basically, as in, of course, in addition to the standard terms, everything, 
the five terms which actually kind of govern your entire right, role, obligations, whatever you call it. Uh, First, Zafir, one second. Coaches, yeah. I think you should write this down. <laughs> So the first one, the first one is what is the role, role of a coach expectation and the scope of the services of the coach as in what his job will entail. That would be point one. So agreement should be very clear on that Two, And, and under that, it would also cover stuff like what is the coach entitled to like, can he bring in his own coaching staff, etc. All that would come under that. Like what are the rights that he has as a coach as well? Number two would be the remuneration and terms of payment. So that should also be very clear as to when will the coach be paid, how much the coach will be paid, when will the coach be paid, is there a performance incentive uh, and to what account would that would such amount be paid. Third would be the term and termination as in what is the duration of your contract and whether it can be terminated during the, uh, I, I mean it should be whether it can be terminated during the term of the contract and if so on what grounds can it be terminated and if it is terminated by either party whether any payment is can be whether a coach is entitled to a payment if uh, the club terminates the uh, employment the fourth would be the dispute resolution that is uh, what are the different uh, as in, in case of a dispute between the coach and the club what is uh, the solution how how would you address the solution how would you address such a dispute and the fifth would be what is the liability uh, i mean in legal term we generally call it as an indemnity obligation but i'm i'm just kind of simplifying it it's called what is the liability of the coach to the club and the club to the coach that is in case of an injury to a player in case of uh, some issue with integrity on integrity or breach of moral code of conduct yeah. then what is the liability i mean is the coach responsible for something or can the can the coach claim something from uh, the club so these are the five broad issues that i would say are uh, five broad things that one should be very careful about in the contract because these are the, the ones that are likely to give rise to a dispute that's it perfect so I think Dinesh, like you asked me to summarize what we discussed, like I, I probably think it's best to do it with an anecdote. So after AIFF, when we started off the bench, uh, we reached out to a bunch of people. So everyone was like, hey, oh, very nice. What are you doing? All that and all. And then they heard, oh, lawyer. That's all. After that, there used to be silence. So then one day, Mira and I, we met Nikhil in GK and so we were like, yeah, this is the response. Like everyone says, oh, lawyer. And then there's silence. And then Nikhil said, yeah. So because when you say lawyer, everyone gets scared. So no one's going to get back to you. So why don't you call yourself an advisor? And advisor gave us some more leads. Like, okay, fine. And then people came back and we spoke and all that. So I, I think that's one thing that I always tell people when we speak uh, for the first time or so. Like the general understanding is, Unless I'm going to court or I need someone to argue my case, I don't need a lawyer. But I, I, being transactional lawyers or doing a large amount of transactions, I think one of the important roles we play by being lawyers is also avoiding going to court at a later point of time or having to go into a dispute at all. And I think with the knowledge on the panel, we covered very well as to what are the key pointers that need to be kept in mind when you're signing that contract. And uh, I mean, hopefully we helped as well. Yeah. Thank you, Srini. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and all those who are listening to us and we'll be also uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, uh, we have OTB with us uh, for any legal assistance to uh, AIFC and all the coaches. And we are happy to share their contact details to all of them. We have Nikhil here and uh, uh, also uh, Javed ji. So thank you so much. I mean, uh, I think it was very interesting. We've already 22 minutes overboard, but yeah, <laughs> time just went by and I think it was interesting. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Javed ji. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you, Zafir. And uh, Shini, thank, thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone for joining and, and hope to catch you for the next session. Thank, thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, thanks everybody. Bye-bye.